I have a portfolio of seven properties. I am king stuff when it comes to real estate. And then the 2005, 2006, euphoria. I'm a millionaire. Look at me. Look at my paper. I've got 10 properties right here. They're all worth 100 grand a piece. Millionaire, I didn't have to put anything down on them, but I've got a million bucks worth of real estate. And so they're just in this euphoria stage. And 2006 comes along. I'm thinking, hey, property values, things are slowing down. It's starting to slip just a little bit, but ah. That's not going to last very long. This is America. We're going up. This is what we're doing, right? And then 2007, pessimism. 2008, panic. Holy smokes. My $100,000 worth of property, or my $1 million worth of property, is now worth $350,000. And I just lost my job. And how am I going to make mortgage payments? In fact, my tenants aren't even paying anymore. Everybody is running scared right there. Now, you know what happens right here when masses are running scared? People like me start going the opposite direction. We opened up an auction bidding service. We started collecting all the properties off of creative financing and wholesaling deals. We're taking advantage of the opportunity. I'm sorry people lost their houses. I'm sorry people had to go through a hard time. I'm not sorry for the stupidity because they didn't learn how to invest properly. But we stepped in and take advantage of it. Now we've got houses where I can buy in 2008 and 9 in Phoenix. They're only four years old in the primary market for $45,000. Today they're worth one hundred and thirty in a short period of time. Wholesaler mentality investor mentality, not retail mentality. I like to think of black belt investors as Costco, not Nordstrom's. We like things in bulk, we like them cheap with quality products. I'm not going to go to Nordstrom's and go buy the same product. Okay? Everybody's panicking, basically despair in 2009. In 2010, a little bit of hope starts to trickle back in. Relief is happening. Now we're back to optimism and enthusiasm. People are now jumping on the bandwagon. That's why we've got so many real estate clubs popping up with people that have never even invested before. Actually, a lot of your real estate clubs today are not real estate investors, they're just real estate agents that don't own any property. They may own, an, uh, you know, they may be a custodian or an IRA company. They may be mortgage brokers, but they've never invested before. They're just there to sell. And now people are starting to fill up the rooms and start selling their boot camps and all that good stuff again. So. Kind of, you know what? It's, it's just repeating itself again. Now, here's the thing. Who thinks we have a bubble? Anybody think we have a bubble in this market right now? Nobody? Why not? You do? Why? Well, I'm not saying quite a bubble, but I think I don't trust anyone in the financial business. I don't trust the figures. I don't trust, I think the, the world's being run by crooks right now. They're manipulating everything, and I think one should be very careful to be still one house. Yes, if I had a star, I'd give it to you. If I had a star, I'd just give it to you. Because you're absolutely right. But here's, here's the thing, a lot of people say, oh, you know, we're repeating this again. You're going to buy real estate and it's going to crash. You know what? This has been happening since day one. People started getting into real estate. Real estate was free. Then it was a dime an acre. Then it was a quarter an acre. And then it was 50 cents an acre. Then it fell 35 cents an acre. We've always done this. This is nothing new. The psychology is nothing new. We always have the herd mentality. The thing is, is that when you're doing this, we're always going like this. That's the thing. I mean, my mom and dad could have bought the house that we lived in Downey in 1973 for $24,000. That's worth 500 grand today. What's a mortgage payment on $24,000? Well, 10% of you've got a 10% loan. That's 240 bucks. But you know what they did? They rented for 30. We've always had this. Now, here's the difference, everybody. The difference between this market and the last market of going through this up climb and this up climb. Lending, interest-only loans, no qualifying. Investors, home buyers. Hmm. Here's the difference over here. Home buyers, investors. Home buyers have to really qualify today. Investors, all cash transactions. There's no paper. 
gives us a little bit more stability in this market is what it does. The people that can afford to do it are actually doing it. And that brings a whole new dynamic into this market. So when is the right time to invest? Is it at the bottom? Is it at the top? Is it at the bottom? Is it at the top? You tell me. What's that? Right away. Right away. I like that answer. Okay. Well, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'll invest at any point in the market. As long as I'm buying it wholesale, as long as it's affordable, as long as I'm buying something that's diversified, as long as it cash flows. Then I don't care if it's up here or down here. Obviously, I'm a wholesaler, so I'm always going to want to buy at the bottom, but it doesn't stop me from buying in a retail market because we're actually kind of in a retail market today. Kind of. We're not exactly in a retail market, but we're kind of in a retail market. And didn't uh, this Kate keep, right? Did Keith say that he got something at $60,000? He did. Yeah, he did. Wow, they're out there. Hey, you want to hear a really cool deal real quick? I'll make it fast. So uh, I own a marketing company called Jabbermouth Marketing, and they, and so my marketing company does my social media management, right? Well, I, I've made uh, a little over $100,000 in just social media just this year alone, okay? And that's from deals. And so here's the thing. I had this girl from Palmdale give us a call and say, hey, I noticed that you've got a real estate club over in Downey, and my parents passed away that owned a property in Downey. It was originally my grandparents. Saw so you on Facebook. We would like to know if you'd like to list the property. Well, I'm not a real estate agent, but my wife is. So she's a realtor. I said, yeah, we can list it for you, no problem. I'm very familiar with the area. She told me where it was, and I know exactly where it's at. And so we got uh, this, this property. We met with them, and they were going to fix it up. And they thought it was going to be a $10,000 rehab. I'm like, mm -hmm, this is going to be like a $40,000, $45,000 rehab. They didn't have the money to do that type of a rehab. Well, it hasn't been updated since the 70s. And so what ended up happening was this. I said, well, I can do whatever you want. I can list the property for you. If I know that you're in Palmdale, your sister lives in Lancaster, and you got another sister who lives in Las Vegas. So they're out of area zone, kind of textbook, right? Cosmetic fixer, textbook. Parents pass away, textbook. You know what I see? Leverage, leverage, leverage. That's going to give me a deal. So I said, I can do this. I can list the property for you if you like, no problem. In fact, I'll even list it at a discount for you. If you want to rehab it, I'd be more than happy to manage your project for you. I do that for a flat 3500 bucks. So I'll make sure I'll get all the estimates, itemize everything out, put it all together, and make sure the crews are here. We have the property for you for 3500 bucks. And so they were thinking about it, thinking about it, and they came back to me and said, you know what, uh, we'd just actually like to sell it to you if you're interested in it. And so here's the thing. Amy, her name's Amy, Amy says, you know, I know the house is worth $300,000, but as is, probably two seventy. dollars Those are the numbers that I gave her. And she's right, because we verified it through comps and such. Um, I said, well, Amy, what do you want out of this house? What is it that your sister is looking at? She says, we'd like to net 200 on this house. I said, okay, so that means I'd have to buy it from you at 203000 bucks. That way it'll pay for your closing costs. It's more than enough to pay for closing costs. And she says, cool, write it up. I said, but I don't want to buy it for $203,000. What do you think she's thinking right now? Yeah. I said, $215,000. So I'll give you $215,000 for this house. And her boyfriend chimes in and goes, what? Because her boyfriend's listening, right? I said, yeah, I'll pay $215,000 for this house. Here's what I want you to do. Look, you got you and your sisters. This is an emotional deal, right? And she goes, yes, it is. I said, I will put it back in better state than what your grandparents had. I want to make it really nice. I want to give as much money as I can to you and your two sisters. I'll pay $215,000 for it, and I will make you payments interest only every single month until it's sold, and you will get the difference. So more likely, you're going to make about an extra $20,000 off this property. Not only that, I will take care of the closing costs. And you know what she ended up doing? Crying. She said, let's write it up. And her boyfriend says, wait a minute. At what interest rate are you going to pay this? Ah, oh, well today it's a little bit under 4%. I'll give you 6 And she said, done. Write it up. So I've got this owner financing deal that I just closed on at 6% interest. Closed on it in August. First payment's not due until October 1st, which I just made. That's $1,075 a month. Now, I turned around and resold it to one of my coaching students that's a rehabber for $265,000 with a $50,000 down payment at 10.33%, which is $1975 per month, starting September 1st. 
$1,975. He gives me $1,975. I pocket $900. I pay Amy $1,075. Not only that, he also has to, uh, I built in the contract where I get to list the property. Oh, by the way, we just got recent comps for four twenty-five. dollars So he's going to make about $75,000, $80,000 off this house. I made close to $80,000 off this house. By the way, what did it cost me, everybody? Not one red cent. I used his money to pay the closing costs. I didn't put any money in, did anything. There's no down payment or nothing. That's the type of deals that we do all the time. That's our bread and butter. So they're out there, whether we're on the retail side or we're on the wholesale side, okay? Warren Buffett, we all know who Warren Buffett is, right? He is not sing Margaritaville, that's the other Buffett. But Warren Buffett says this, he says, hey, rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. Hey, listen, in this business, we all lose money. We all lose money in this business. In fact, I don't know of any business that no one's ever lost any money. You own a convenience store, someone's going to steal Twinkies, right? You lost some money. It is funny because I was on a panel two weeks ago and some guy um, says, you know, we've done literally hundreds and hundreds of deals the past few years and I've never lost one red penny. And I'm thinking, liar, liar, liar. We all lose money in this business. Babe Ruth is the king of home runs, right? But he strikes out. But he knows the law of averages that he's going to be hitting home runs. However, it's reversed on this side of real estate. We'll hit home run, home run, home run, home run, strike out, lose one. I flip properties every single year for myself. I lost money in 2012 on seven houses, but all the other houses made a lot more money than what I lost, okay? So what is real estate worth today? Well, properties are traditionally valued in a few different ways. Comparable approach. We use that towards single family residential properties, right? That's why when you go out and look at properties, we want to pull the comps because we go off of the value from the sales of like properties. Okay. Not difficult to figure out, but when we're in a very soft market, sometimes that becomes very difficult. So let's say for an example, Detroit. You don't use a comparable approach over there on single family houses. All the companies that are selling properties that are Detroit, they're selling you on cash flow. Return on investment is what they're doing. They say, hey, look at this over here. You can buy this house for $35,000 and they only paid three because you're going to get you know, 700 bucks a month in rents. For selling a cash flow. It's not a good way to sell something, okay? But it is hard to determine in hard hit areas. Then we have the cost approach, basically rebuilding the property. What are the insurance companies? How do they take a look at the property? They take a look at the property by cost approach. What is it going to cost to replace this building? Replacement cost. And again, we like to use this number here when we're in uncertain markets. So back in, let's say, I'm heavy in Phoenix, so look, when we're in Phoenix, when we're in that uncertain market, we are going, hey, you're now buying below 50% builder's costs because numbers were all over the place. You know, they were just all over the place. Then we have the income approach. And this is going to be really used towards those multifamily buildings or that commercial building. This is why they use the capitalization rate or the gross rent multiplier. They measure it off of the, uh, the income versus the single family homes. They measure that property off of the sales. Why? Because commercial and multi-units were really designed for cash flow. Houses were not. Houses appreciate much better. They're at the top of the food chain when it comes to appreciation versus multi-units and commercial. They don't appreciate very well. So that's why when you're selling commercial property, they sell you on the cap rate. Now we're kind of in a funky market right now, aren't we? Because we can take a look at properties and now we're selling houses on a cap rate when normally we couldn't do something like that. So the question is this, if owning is so much cheaper than renting, then why don't renters just start buying? Why? Okay, they don't have the down payment. Credit score. Can't get a loan. Can't get a loan. Gotta move. Okay, if they can't afford rent and they're renting, because a lot of times, well, a lot of the properties in today's market, your rents are actually higher than what your mortgage payment would be, right? All those answers you gave are true. The number one is here, the psychology. Renters mentality is what they have. My mom and dad, for example, 32 years renting the same stupid house. How many times could they pay for that house? 
renter's mentality is what they had. It's not that they couldn't afford it. Credit wasn't the best, but didn't we just hear the gentleman come up here and say, hey, we got FHA loans, and if you don't have a down payment, we can actually even lend it to you? It's not that. It's the education. It's the renter's mentality. We see rental demands increasing over the next several years all over the place. People are sick of real estate that went through a really bad time during the Great Recession. People are still not employed. I don't care what the numbers show. Those numbers are skewed or screwed or whatever you want to say they are. Okay? And don't look at that at all. Because if you're not employed for a certain uh, for a certain amount of time, they just drop you, and they're not even a statistic anymore to make it look better. Declining FICO scores, ballooning student loan debts. So I was just talking to uh, my chiropractor yesterday that I'm actually helping him. He's on my coaching thing, and it's, it has nothing to do with real estate. It's about building his business. And he's like, man, my student loans are just way out there. Interest rates are crazy. That holds them back from doing a lot of things. Tight credit markets and banks not lending, going to a cash basis. Slow new home construction. Most of America's slow new home construction with the exception of some primary markets. And people start, uh, or people short of cash, down payment, like you mentioned. Lack of inventory due to investors. Is there a lack of inventory? <laughs> yes, there is, but here's the thing. It's out there. Most people are just looking in the wrong places. So if you're familiar with Oliver Chang, anybody know Oliver Chang? Oh man, you guys got to start digging in and learning this stuff. Across the country, more Americans are becoming home renters and fewer Americans are becoming homeowners. The beginning of the Rentership Society is upon us, Oliver Chang. Now he is like one of the foremost authorities when it comes to housing and security uh, uh, as a strategist. You know what it reminds me of? America reminds me of Europe. Can't buy. Price is too high. The lending's not there. If the lending's there, you got to put down a very large down payment. Families now moving in with each other. That's what we've been experiencing the last six, seven years. It's kind of the same trend. So here's our profit centers when it comes to real estate: fix and flip. Looking for paydays? You got to fix and flip or wholesale and just assign the contractual rights like we do. Now, just think about it. If you did four a year. Making a measly fifteen thousand dollars per property, that's an extra sixty grand per year. Anybody in here can use an extra sixty grand per year? Your hand better up, because if you're not, it's not up, you're lying to me right now. I can use an extra six bucks right now. Okay? <laughs> lease options or seller financing. Now, the difference between the two here is lease option basically means rent to own. It's kind of like leasing a car. You know, you go to the car dealership, you put down down payments, which is a option consideration fee, you pay the monthly mortgage payment, or you make or you're, I'm sorry, you pay the monthly rent or you pay the fee, uh, monthly fee to the uh, lender for your car. And at the end of the option, you decide that you're either going to buy that car or give it back. Well, we do the same thing when it comes to houses on the lease option side. Seller financing is when you actually become the bank. You become the bank. So what I'd like to get our investors to do, we've got a lot of investors that do not want the landlordship duties. They like holding notes. They just like collecting the, the, uh, the rents or the mortgage payments, is what I should say. So I say, you know what, instead of giving your money to some company over here, and they take your money and go invest in notes, why don't you just buy a house in an area that you like, a house that you like, and then sell it on seller financing so that you, com you have complete control? And that way, if you ever have to take that house back, it's a house that you like in an area that you like. To me, that makes better sense. Hasn't the Dog Frank Act um, made it more difficult to be a? Yes, client? they have. But we have legal loopholes that we can get around. And, and one of the things that I like to do, remember, I keep saying control that C word, control, control. Well, most people that offer uh, offer a loan on a property, let's say, for instance, you shop for a, a loan through Bank of America to buy your home. You get the loan. You get your home. Who gets the deed? Who gets the deed in that? The buyer gets the deed. You get the deed. You just bought the house. You get the deed. So you get the control. That's why the bank must foreclose on you to regain that control. Okay? Ah, but the way we do it in Black Belt Investors, you sell the property, just like Bank of America gives you the loan. We give the loan to a buyer, but you keep the deed. That way we don't have to foreclose. We just evict. 
faster process, cheaper, more control. Okay? Better strategies. There's three ways to make cash. Either way you go. In the lease option, we're going to uh, get an option consideration fee, which is non-refundable. Seller financing, we're going to get a down payment. The monthly payment on the lease option is going to be a rental premium that goes right into my pocket and right into your pocket. And that rental premium is actually going to be a small percentage that will be used towards the principal reduction when they decide to buy and or towards their down payment. So let's say, for instance, everybody in the room, we all own properties in this one subdivision. And you're all getting about $800 a month until I walk in, I get the same type of house you guys have, put the same type of renter in there, except for my renter is now renter slash buyer. And I'm not getting just $800, I'm getting an extra 200 bucks. So now I'm getting $1,000. I'm making $2,400 more than everybody else in the subdivision. What does that do for me? My return on investment goes up much more than everybody else. Now that extra $200 goes into my pocket, the $800 out of that goes into the, for the rents. It's a forced savings for that new buyer, tennis life buyer. If they decide to not exercise their option, they don't get that money back. It's not refundable. And on the seller financing side, well, when you're offering owner financing, you're not going to get the 3.5 to 4.5 percent rates. That's if you have good credit. People that are doing owner financing typically don't have the best credit. More than likely, they're going to be charging between 8 and 10 percent of the loan amount. And that money now goes into your pocket. How do you keep the deed when you're selling finance? You have to use a, land, a contract for deed or a land installment contract. And so it's all paperwork. And if you guys ever do that, just let us know. We'll put it together for you. Okay? But that way, if D doesn't transfer over, they actually have to. Uh, it's kind of like it's, it's kind of. Let's use the analogy of the car. We were talking about leasing car. Has anybody ever bought a new car before? Okay. Okay. I hate buying new cars. But you go to the car lot, right? And you get a loan, and you put down some money to buy this car. You got to make monthly payments. Who has the pink slip? Oh, if you buy if you buy a car using a loan, you got to make monthly payments. Who has the pink slip? The bank. We do the same thing car dealerships do. We keep that pink slip. Okay. Why? So they can repossess that car. That also gets you out of the repairs. Yes. It's owner financing, so that means I'm now stepping out of landlordship duties, and they must take care of everything. And they get all the rights to the tax benefits, and they can fix it up, and they can refinance it if they want and cash me out. They can sell it if they want. And that's when I'll ante up the deed. So I just work like a car dealership or a lending facility. Okay. Cash flow rentals. Well, that's what everybody wants, right? We do these three items right here to start building our cash income stream so that we can eventually start buying rental properties. We flip, 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 flip. Oh, let's take one and buy one. Flip, 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 flip. Let's take this and put this in our portfolio. And now we're buying properties. The number one reason I like to buy rental properties is for that word up there, appreciation. I'm after the appreciation. Appreciation is the quickest path to wealth. However, when you're buying strong appreciating properties, more than likely, they're not going to cash flow that well. California, Phoenix, Las Vegas, you're buying for appreciation is what you're buying for. However, we also have to keep that balance in there and get some cash flow as well. So if I'm going to get cash flow, then I'm going to move into other markets like Indianapolis, Kansas City, in Cleveland. So that way, my high appreciating properties, I'll focus on the appreciation side. Properties 100,000, doubles in 10 years, 200,000, building that net worth. But my cash flow properties that were inexpensive, that gives me a really good cap rate, will now fund my properties for any vacancies. So I got this balance going on. But do you have a tendency to pay cash on the cash flow properties and loan on the appreciation? Would I have a tendency to pay cash on the cash flow properties? Yeah. More than likely, the cash flow properties that I personally target, you can only come in with cash. Right. So, but like over in Indianapolis and Kansas City, um, if I could put a loan against it, then I would because I like to leverage my money. But I'm going to leverage it to where it still um, completely benefits me. Meaning that, you know, I now have a loan for 400 bucks, but I'm getting 900 dollars a month in rents. You know, I'm not going to get 900 dollars loan on 900. And rents and break even. That's not very smart. And what type of loans would you be getting if you can only get four before the bank say no, nope, no more? Well, you can get ten, and I and I can't get ten because I'm already tapped out. Okay. So you know what I have to do? I have to pay cash for my properties, or I got to do this right here. Gotcha. That's what we got to do. That's how we can step in and build our portfolio. Is either 
doing cash and or owner financing type of stuff. Now, I like to keep my cash right where it's at in my account. So I'm going to do my best to focus my efforts on these strategies right here to build my portfolio. Okay? Using someone else's dime, using someone else's name on credit. And let me just do what I need to do. Okay? So people are buying for appreciation. This is what most people are buying for is cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Everybody wants cash flow on their portfolio. Well, cash flow is great. We all need it, no doubt. But don't be misled. Meaning that people that are buying on cash flow are really buying to replace their income. I don't I haven't met anybody buying rental properties, houses and stuff, to become wealthy because of cash flow. It's an income stream. They become wealthy because of the appreciation, the equity that's in the property. See? So we'll need both, but one is to build wealth and one is to replace the income that you're bringing in or maybe increase the income. Yes, sir? And those are two physical different areas. Yes. Um, however, we could have bought properties when I was telling everybody to buy properties in California, Vegas, and Phoenix in 08, 9, 10, 11, and they could have got both. Because that's exactly what we did. I'll be honest, we went and we raped the auctions in Phoenix. We took everything that we could afford to buy. Because the cheapest brand new house that we can buy in Phoenix is about $28,000. Well, they're selling for about $90,000 today. And that's only three, four short years. Boom! It went right up. You know what? There's a small window of opportunity in certain markets that you can do that again. And that's what I'm doing right now. Okay? So here's the thing. you got to decide. Do I want to be cash rich? Or do I want financial security? Or you can be kind of like me and greedy in real estate and want all three. Because I want the tax deductions because I own businesses. I need to shelter my ordinary income. I need to bring that down. I need the deductions. Just like most white collar workers do. I want the cash flow because I'm an income stream guy. I have this hub right here called my bank account. And I have flipping houses coming in. I have rental income coming in. I have creative financing deals coming in. I have education coming in. I'm a hard money lender. I have lending coming in. I have consulting coming in. I own a marketing company. I own seven real, uh, martial art and boxing gyms coming in. I'm an income stream type of guy. Why? Because when markets shift, incomes either increase or decrease. And real estate is one of those things is when we hit a recession, it always drops. However, when it comes to my fitness gyms, doesn't look like it, huh? But I have them. When it comes to my fitness gyms, you know what? Recession proof, I've been through three recessions. Why? Because everybody still wants to lose weight and everybody still wants a babysitter. Are you doing much with self-directed IRAs? Uh, a lot of our investors come to us with self-directed IRAs and we get them to move right over to check writing privileges so that way they can buy at the auctions or they can buy these properties that we have to offer um, that can't get a loan on. Okay, so yes, a lot of investors definitely tap into that. Why? Because they're not making any money in their IRA accounts. It's tax-free. Yeah, absolutely. You said the banks will go up to 10 now. That's a relatively new thing. How does it's that not a new thing. It's been around for a while. It's been around for a while. There's certain smaller, higher risk mortgage companies out there that will actually give you um, up to 10 loans. You know, but it, as a whole, if you're looking at like at Wells Fargo, Bank of America, or what are you going to pay for that? Is it? I don't know. I, don't, I, I haven't done a loan. I haven't done a loan in a long time. I couldn't even tell you to be honest. I mean a conventional loan. I do unconventional loans. So, um, and the investors, this year is the first year since 2007 I'm actually working with someone buying investment properties and they're buying four using a conventional loan. It's the first year. Everybody else has been cash the whole time. So, I couldn't give you that part. That would be the other guy that came up here to tell you that. So, the thing is, is when you have these three ingredients right here, that is going to be your true wealth builder. Okay. If you're just looking at one of these things, that's not going to be a wealth builder. You need all three. You need to tie them in. So that means you've got to diversify your investments in areas where you can collect appreciation, cash flow, and definitely use as much of the tax benefits as you can. Now, short-term versus long-term strategies, areas that are projected to appreciate. 
Invest in short-term rentals as a vehicle to create capital for multiple reasons, such as banking cash. People need to bank cash. I just put out a little tweet yesterday. Here's a millionaire tip. Spend less than what you earn. <laughs>